Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Delivering Single Molecule Proteomics at Scale Using Protein Identification by Short Epitope Mapping. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Nautilus Biotechnology. To learn more, visit nautilus.bio. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Parag Malik, Founder and Chief Scientist, Nautilus Biotechnology. Parag, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and learn a little bit more about how our platform works. My hope today was really to describe in a little bit more detail the different aspects of the platform, our thoughts in creating it, and to answer any questions that you might have uh, to really dive into the details. So we'll start off by just taking a step back. And from my own experiences as a proteomics researcher for many years, there are many questions you might ask and say, okay, well, if we were to start over, if we were to say, instead of trying to innovate or extend existing approaches, what might we want our next generation proteomics platform to look like? What capabilities might we want it to have? Now, I'm not going to uh, presume that our Nautilus platform is going to be able to address all of these uh, challenges. But when we reached out to proteomics researchers and said, well, what do you want? Um, there were a very compact set of criteria that came up over and over again. Um, uh, are you now able to see the presentation? Yes. Great. I, I, did, I didn't want to interrupt because you were on a roll, but uh, go ahead. Great. Um, so taking a step back and saying, what would you want to see? Um, uh, there were a clear set of criteria. Um, number one, you wanted the you wanted the platform to be comprehensive. You wanted to measure substantively all of the proteins. We also wanted a platform that was sensitive, ideally able to capture those very rare proteins um, that, uh, that um, you know, were major drivers of biology. Um, at the same time, we recognize that the scale of the proteome is very vast. And so being able to measure uh, not just extremely sensitively, but the entire range of the proteome. Um, of course, you want the platform to be reproducible and robust uh, so that you have a path to the clinic. Um, importantly, you would want a platform that can run very quickly so that you can crunch through a large number of samples and build those large cohorts and really drive the biology that you want to learn. Uh, and then importantly, ideally, the platform should be easy to use, something that's accessible to the broader biologic community, um, not just to um, you know, the, the limited set of labs that are able to um, execute on very complex workflows. But of course, building a platform that's able to achieve on all of these metrics is, is challenging. Um, the, there are a couple of particular reasons why interrogating the proteome is so hard. Uh, number one, the protein, proteins span this incredibly wide dynamic range, um, ranging from, from uh, you know, a handful of molecules to, uh, to to potentially millions or billions of molecules. And that's particularly exacerbated because there's no PCR for proteins. If you only had one molecule of something in a sample, you can't make more. Um, and on top of that, you layer the challenge that proteins themselves are biophysically extremely diverse, um, large, small, charged, hydrophobic, et cetera. Uh, and then each protein is not just alone. Uh, it exists in a wide range of, of states, modifications, PTMs, proteoforms, et cetera. And so as we were thinking about these challenges and thinking about how to uh, build an, a new platform, 
uh, one of the clear opportunities was potentially to build a platform that was a single molecule platform. Um, and so what are the opportunities there? Well, one of the great opportunities with being a single molecule platform is it's definitionally as sensitive as it can be. If you're measuring individual molecules, you can't be more sensitive. There's no transition to intensity or brightness uh, where there's a loss of information. Another thing that happens very specifically at the single molecule level is that the challenge of quantification itself changes. If I can identify each of my individual molecules, identification becomes quantification. Um, by identifying every individual molecule, I just count up those identifications, and that is my quantification. Um, one of the other opportunities in a single molecule platform is operating on intact proteins. Um, being able to probe proteiforms because you're looking at, at intact proteins as opposed to digesting them where you lose the contextual information of knowing that multiple modifications or isoforms of modifications are present with an individual molecule. Um, the other opportunity, of course, is, again, just in looking at direct protein measurement versus fragment measurement, is that some of the dynamic range challenges that are exacerbated by operating with peptides, uh, some of the challenges in data analysis and interpretation that arise from peptide to protein assembly are, um, are, are naturally simpler. On the other hand, you have a series of challenges that have to be overcome. The, the first is, how do you guarantee that you're looking at single molecules as opposed to sets of molecules? How do you actually both sensitively measure individual protein molecules and do it fast enough that you can have a wide dynamic range? The approach that I'm going to discuss today attempts to address these, these challenges. Um, so, uh, And really, the platform has two different pieces. The first is a sophisticated sample preparation approach that uh, attempts to take individual molecules from the sample and array them out on a nanofabricated chip in which each individual molecule from the sample lives in its own coordinate on the chip. Um, this, uh, and so we'll discuss that first. And then the second piece of the platform is an instrument and machine learning framework that iteratively probes each of those molecules over and over and over again with a series of reagents in order to identify and characterize each of those molecules. So as in building towards this platform, we have two big challenges. The first is uh, how does one actually densely immobilize uh, individual protein molecules uh, on a surface? Uh, and then the second question is how does one identify them? And along the way, we'll talk about some of the characteristics about the sample preparation, stability, uh, potent breadth of the proteome, et cetera, um, to try and answer some of the key questions that you might ask. So diving in now to ask the question about how does one uh, actually densely immobilize individual protein molecules? The way this is traditionally done is using an approach called limiting dilution. In this approach, you take a sample, you dilute it substantially, and then you spread those molecules out. Uh, again, these are molecules from the sample uh, onto a surface. Now, uh, what this results in is that the vast majority of the space on your chip ends up empty, so about 90% typically. Um, but uh, the loading is what's called Poisson loading, which means that wherever there is a protein, there are 50% of the time likely to be two or more. In particular, 25% of the sites that are occupied will be occupied with two proteins, 12% with three, and on and on and on. And this is, so this is suboptimal for two reasons. One, you're not actually guaranteeing that you have single molecules. It's also suboptimal because you're wasting a lot of space with nothingness, uh, which from a measurement perspective is then inefficient. One of the critical characteristics of the platform is that you want to be able to measure a very large number of molecules. Um, you get your sensitivity from it being a single molecule readout. You get your dynamic range from measuring a large number of molecules. Just to go into a little bit more detail on that, um, one of the questions you might ask is, well, OK, I, if I want to measure the proteome, um, just how many molecules would I want to measure to capture the vast majority of it in a single experiment? So we, one experiment you can do, uh, one simulation, is you can take the distribution of proteins in the proteome, and you can, uh, you can lay them out um, onto a chip and ask the question, how many of them get deposited as a function of the number of occupancy sites 
And so we took uh, the currently known distribution of protein abundances within, uh, within a cell lysate um, and then arrayed them on chips of different feature, size, feature amounts. So whether 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8, or 10 to the 10. And what you can see is that there's a consequence to that on the dynamic range. So if we consider the dynamic range to being um, the least abundant uh, protein to the most abundant protein, um, and then we also want to consider at any given concentration, what percent of the proteins at that concentration are we capturing? You can see that there's a sweet spot around 10 to the 10 that allows you to capture substantively all of the proteome um, within a single experiment. Uh, and um, and we'll go through in greater detail. You see this inset line here is talking about what percent of those are actually identified, and you'll see that it's substantively all at a given concentration range. So really, the key limiting driver is how many molecules can you measure? So we wanted a platform that was able to densely array a very large number of molecules so they could be scanned efficiently and quickly. The way that, uh, and we discussed how, how limiting dilution uh, challenges that. Now, what we'd like to go through now is our approach for how do we actually generate these single molecule hyperdense arrays. Um, so one approach in order to get super Poisson deposition is to, uh, is to try to make landing pads for protein molecules that are very, very small. Um, this is potentially challenging from a technical perspective. And so we instead, the team came up with a really clever approach, which was instead of trying to make the landing pads small, so you had steric occlusion, we instead make the, the proteins large. We do that through the use of an intermediate scaffold, uh, which is shown here. Uh, and so what you can see is a very special nanoparticle that's been fabricated by our team. Oh dear. Um, uh, so this nanoparticle is very special. It has, ex uh, un unlike traditional nanoparticles, which have hundreds of thousands of conjugation sites, this nanoparticle is several hundred nanometers in dimension, um, but can only hold a single protein molecule. Um, and so, which is attached here at the top of this flagpole. You can see an AFM image of these, of these particles here. Um, and so what we then do as our sample preparation is we take our, our nanoparticles, we take our sample, we functionalize them. Uh, we, we functionalize the proteins with a methyl, methyl tetrazine group attaching to either lysines or cysteines. The complementary group to that methyl tetrazine is on the scaffold. Um, we mix them together and attach each individual single protein molecule um, to an individual scaffold. Um, each scaffold can hold exactly one protein molecule. Um, we then uh, take those scaffold protein conjugates and mix them with a specially patterned array uh, so that each scaffold protein conjugate lands on its own landing pad. And this self-assembles uh, our hyperdense array. So just some key characteristics of the simple preparation, and I'm happy to go into more detail uh, in the Q&A, is that the, the actual reaction time is very efficient, as well as uh, the chemistry is quite general, modifying the vast majority of the proteome. This chemistry is broadly similar to the TMT modification chemistry that is routinely used uh, today in proteomics workflows. Um, but the use of the click chemistry by bioorthogonal chemistry allows for uh, a very specific conjugation between the proteins and the scaffolds. Just to dive in to, to look at what the chips actually look like, uh, what you're looking at here on the left is a very small portion of one of the chips. Uh, this is about one one hundred thousandth of a chip. And each one of the, if we zoom in, each one of these little blobs that you see here is one single protein molecule um, arrayed in a hyperdense fashion. Uh, the deposition itself is incredibly efficient uh, so that the vast majority of sites are occupied in the high 90%. Um, and so uh, 
this allows one to generate very quickly and efficiently a single molecule hyperdense protein array, which can then be scanned very quickly when during measurement. To demonstrate that we were in fact getting single molecules, uh, there is a very simple experiment one can perform where one uses differently labeled uh, um, uh, proteins, admixes them together, and asks the question, how often does one see uh, two proteins of different colors landing at the same spot? Uh, what you can see in this deposition, um, we have uh, one set of proteins in green, another in purple. Um, and when you mix them together, uh, for the most part, uh, you see uh, on only one color represented at a site. In places where there are two uh, of these scaffolds co-localized, um, you'd see a white dot. And you see every now and again, there's a white dot. Um, it's typically under about 1%. Uh, if you'd like to uh, learn more about this method, uh, the uh, a bioarchive um, uh, preprint is available uh, by Axel et al. Um, all right, so just to recap the sample prep workflow from beginning to end, uh, this is, we would start with a typical proteomic sample, blood, tissue, cells, ex et cetera, extract the proteins from, from the sample using traditional uh, proteomic extraction processes. Uh, note that we do not attempt to keep the proteins folded. Uh, we typically use denaturing extractions. Um, we then functionalize the protein, add that methyl tetrazine group, conjugate the proteins to their scaffolds, uh, and then immobilize them on the chip. Uh, the sample prep workflow is, is relatively straightforward uh, and should be accessible to any lab. So switching gears, we now have this question. All right, well, when we've generated this hyperdense single molecule protein array, how do we actually identify each molecule? Well, this is where the instrument and a series of reagents comes in. So uh, there are really two different ways to, uh, to identify each molecule. And we're gonna start with what is the general workflow? So in the general workflow, we're going to immobilize our proteins, introduce a series of labeled probes that uh, can either be protein specific if we're looking for proteiforms, or can be our special class of multi-affinity probes that recognize a multiplicity of proteins. These probes are labeled with an ultra bright fluorophore, which allows us to image where they have bound. We then uh, rinse away unbound material, take a picture and then wipe off, wash away uh, a set of reagents and then come back in and do this over and over and over and over again, um, building these starry skies like images of the data. Some of the questions you might ask are about just how stable uh, is the process. And the proteins are, are again, they are not uh, adsorbed blindly to a surface. They're covalently attached to a scaffold, which is strongly attached to the nanopattern surface. And so what we've seen over hundreds of cycles is that one is able to uh, probe over and over and over again, and the proteins remain immobilized. Um, the typical amount of protein loss through a run is well below 1%. Um, one point I'll mention is that we do, we have the advantage in our platform of being able to use ultra bright nanoparticles as uh, labels for our affinity reagents as well. This allows us to scan very quickly uh, because we are, even though we are looking at single molecule detection, we are not having to do single fluorophore detection. Uh, this allows us, again, our entire platform has been optimized for scale, for measuring a large number of molecules quickly and efficiently. So changing gears, what are the kinds of applications that one might use this platform for? And there really are two very uh, different near-term applications that we've been focused on. The first is using the platform for targeted studies um, to really look at proteoforms. And we'll talk about that first. And then second is transitioning towards broad scale detection. So as many of you are aware, proteoforms are critical drivers of phenotype. Um, when we think about regulation in the biological system, uh, we start with DNA, then uh, 
have are translated to multiple isoforms and then decorate those isoforms with a series of PTMs. So the proteiform is the is the combination of all of those isoforms and PTMs. And there may be millions of these. Critically, it's been very challenging to study the diversity of different proteiforms. Um, in particular, if whenever, with any peptide-centric method, if we look at, for instance, these two samples, the one on the left and the one on the right, the one on the left having one molecule that's triply modified, and then two other molecules that are unmodified, versus a sample on the right where we have three different molecules, each of which are modified at a different loci, from a peptide-centric perspective, uh, if we were to digest these proteins and characterize the peptides, we wouldn't be able to distinguish these two samples from each other. But biologically, they likely have radically different behavior and function. This molecular heterogeneity of proteiforms is likely a major driver of biology. So on the Nautilus platform, the way that we address this question is through, through using a series of commercially available position-specific uh, and isoform-specific reagents, wherein we will um, immobilize our proteins and then probe them over and over again uh, in, again, a non-destructive manner with these different reagents, building up a fingerprint um, for every single molecule. Um, to see what this looks like, um, we, uh, as I said, we have a series of different molecules. We might first probe with a pan molecule to understand where all the EGFRs are, for instance, and then come in with a position-specific reagent looking for 3 and 6 78 and identifying the molecules that have that modification. Wipe off our reagents, come in again with another set of probes that identify a different loci and a different modification, building up uh, over the span of five cycles potentially interrogating as many as 32 distinct proteiforms. To examine this in a real world context, uh, we've been fortunate to partner um, uh, with, with a group at Genentech to look at the protein tau, and in particular, looking at the relationship between isoforms and phosphorylations, uh, where there are a series of different position-specific reagents available. Um, data from this experiment looks a little like this, where we'll have, again, our starry skies, a series of different loci where we have proteins. We'll then do a detection experiment with, for instance, a reagent that looks at uh, anti-phosphotyrosthreonine-181 and identify which molecules have that modification. We'll then wipe off the probes, come in with another reagent that recognizes the 2N isoform, wipe it off, come in again with uh, a reagent that recognizes the 0N. And over a series of cycles, you are then able to build up very detailed maps that say, oh, okay, this particular molecule is the tau 1N with a double modification on top of it, um, really allowing you in detail to look at the molecular heterogeneity of those proteiforms for the first time. Um, digging in we, as one way to validate the system, we can construct, construct a control sample that has a mix of multiple proteiforms together. Um, and then first probe each of those individual proteiforms to make sure that we are in fact able to get them right, mix them together, and then demonstrate that quantitatively one is able to identify and quantify a variety of different proteiforms all within the same sample. Changing gears, proteiform analysis is, is incredibly exciting. And this method of identifying proteins by going after them specifically is a very powerful method that allows us to use existing reagents, particularly ones that were, uh, are used today for Westerns. But for scaling to the entire proteome, going protein by protein would be an inefficient manner. And one of the points that we raised early on was we wanted to be able to go quickly. This brings us to the second piece of our approach, which is the, really the PRISM method. And in this method, instead of go using protein-specific reagents, what we're going to do is we're going to use a series of special reagents, uh, which we call multi-affinity probes, which instead of recognizing whole proteins, recognize very short epitopes, typically three or four amino acids long. Now, these probes are not in any way protein-specific, but what we'll discuss momentarily is that using a series of these probes, each one builds up a little bit of information about each individual molecule. 
And the combination of that collection of information is sufficient to uniquely identify each molecule. Intuitively, this is somewhat like playing guess who with each molecule. There are lots of different strategies for playing guess who. One that's very prevalent is that you can imagine is going and, and asking of each protein, are you Tom? Are you Joe? Are you Anita? Are you George? This is a very inefficient method if I wanted to identify somebody very quickly. On the other hand, one could approach it a slightly different way and say, okay, well, I'm going to ask a question that's a little more general. Uh, are you bald, for instance? Are, are you wearing a hat? Are you blonde? And this would allow me to rule out a large number of people very quickly, such that instead of having to go one by one and ask potentially as, as many as 24 questions to figure out the identity of a person, in one turn, I might be able to rule out half of the people, in two turns, uh, another half, and three turns. And so I can very quickly and efficiently identify a person. So with PRISM, we use a similar approach. We ask a series of questions where we say, all right, well, uh, I have probes that have been raised against a series of short epitopes. I'm going to probe each individual molecule and observe a binding pattern. I'm then going to ask the question, computationally using our machine learning layer, what protein is compatible with this pattern of binding? Uh, and uh, in this case, you can see that we've probed with a series of these uh, these short epitope targeting affinity reagents, and our EGFR protein uh, is able to be recognized um, through a, a series of these bindings, whereas other proteins are incompatible with this combination of affinity reagents. Just to go under the hood of the machine learning, we can see in this, in this uh, animation, or we can see in this plot, uh, over a series of um, of probings, uh, initially with a, with a small number of binding events, the algorithm is not entirely certain what affinity, what protein is present. But after about 10 or 12, it starts to lock in. And by about 15, it's really started to figure out the right answer, which is this GRAC6. Uh, and then from there on, it becomes increasingly confident that the protein at that landing pad is GRAC6. And every other protein becomes vanishingly improbable. One question you might ask is, how many probings are required? How many different affinity reagents are required in order to identify substantively all of the proteome? Um, we know that if we wanted to do this uh, one protein at a time, it would be on the order of tens of thousands. One of the really surprising uh, results from these studies is, is uh, being able to recognize that it simulations show that between two and 300 probes is sufficient to identify substantively all of the proteum. One question would, might be, well, why, why trimers instead of tetramers instead of dimers versus or something longer, five, six, seven, eight amino acids long? And the answer is that trimers are really uh, in the sweet spot between um, being able to tolerate a large number of, uh, of off-target binding events um, while being uh, small enough that each one is able to deconvolve the whole proteome with a small number of reagents. What I'm showing here in this plot uh, is, uh, is asking that question and saying how many probes are required to measure 90% of the proteome. If one were to have probes that perfectly recognized exactly one dimer, it's a really fantastic approach, and one could deconvolve the vast majority of the proteome, decode the vast majority of the proteome, with probably about 150 probes. However, any cross-reactivity such that a dimer recognizes, uh, you know, has a wobble position, um, and instantly it becomes very difficult. Trimers, on the other hand, have a very wide range uh, that um, if, if they recognize a single trimer or a range of similar trimers, uh, 10, 20, even 40, um, you're, they're sufficient to, to efficiently uh, crunch through the proteome. Uh, tetramers require much greater degeneracy in order to uh, efficiently profile the proteome um, uh, in a smaller number of cycles. One question we get asked a lot is, can one actually build affinity reagents that recognize short epitopes? Uh, the answer is we've put a lot of effort into a series of different strategies, uh, both 
uh, on the aptamer and antibody development side, uh, showing here a process of phage display that we've been developing internally. Um, and the products of some of those are shown down below uh, where we're looking at affinity reagents against uh, both tetramers and trimers. One of the things that you'll note is that the EC50s of these are in the picomolar range. In the, and these are incredibly tight binders um, and that uh, just for frame of reference, many clinical antibodies uh, are not picomolar binders. So uh, the first step that we will undergo is we'll, we'll do our phage display processes uh, to identify antibodies or CLX to identify um, aptamers or other uh, approaches, identify a series, validate that they bind to their intended target, but then we go one step further and characterize uh, their off-target binding as well, um, using a series of epitope mapping arrays that allow us to detail in not just the initial epitope that they recognize, but the family of related epitopes. And this has been really interesting. Uh, for instance, one of the affinity reagents that we use extensively, which was raised against the HHH epitope, actually binds quite well to a series of related epitopes, including HYH. Um, and typically this would be a challenge for affinity-based platforms, but on our platform, this is actually an advantage. It allows for a given reagent to have a broader reach and allows for potentially identifying more proteins more efficiently. One of the key questions of the platform and one of the key attributes that one needs to address is that this is a single molecule platform with a tremendous amount of stochasticity. Consequently, there is not a single canonical fingerprint um, that one might anticipate. Uh, it is likely that every single molecule will have a series of different bindings from each reagent, and that the combination of those bindings, uh, really we're asking the question, given an observed pattern of binding, what protein is compatible with this pattern of binding? We're not anticipating a singular pattern for any given protein. Uh, and this is why there is a sophisticated machine learning framework under the hood of PRISM. One other question that may arise is just how sensitive is PRISM to the specific set of targets and affinity reagents? Uh, one might anticipate that there's a singular perfect set of a particular set of trimers that one might go after and that others might not be as effective. We investigated that question and found that, uh, that actually there is an optimal probe set um, targeting an optimal set of of uh, epitopes. However, even a random probe set uh, does, does very well. And so there's a tremendous amount of flexibility around what probes uh, are used and what targets are used in the platform. So coming back to our initial set of questions in building, uh, building our platform, uh, you know, when we started, we discussed wanting an approach that had a series of characteristics in terms of being comprehensive and sensitive having a wide dynamic range, being reproducible, a rapid runtime. And the platform has been designed to with these design criteria in mind. Um, in particular, uh, the platform aims to deliver sensitivity at scale, uh, being comprehensive, being able to measure substantively all of the proteome within a single experiment. Uh, it has been designed for single molecule sensitivity. It being a single molecule platform really allows it to be as sensitive as possible. The dynamic range comes from measuring a very large number of, of molecules and doing so very quickly. Uh, the entire platform has been optimized to be able to measure a large number of proteins very, very, very quickly. The reproducibility and robustness, it is a digital readout uh, and um, which contributes to reproducibility, not having to think about the peptide assembly problem and the variation that can come through peptide protein assembly as well, um, helps support the reproducibility as well as the ease of the sample handling workflow. The throughput, uh, again, we discussed that the instrument um, is efficient as well as the dense protein deposition allows scanning a large number of molecules very quickly. The PRISM method itself, relying upon a series of multi-affinity probes, allows one to measure a greater percentage of the proteome in a smaller number of touches. And then lastly, the platform itself is highly integrated uh, with a very simple workflow, um, both on the experimental side and the computational side um, to help ease adoption. So 
one last point I'll mention is that we are hiring. Um, so please do check out the opportunities on our career page. We're always looking for great people to come join the Nautilus family. So, and with that, I'll pause and, and stop for questions. And thank you again for taking time uh, out of your day to, to come sit down with us today. Thank you, Parag, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, is the platform compatible with non-human samples? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, the the method because it uses these multi affinity probes, which target short epitopes, is fully general um, to to human, yeast, mouse, uh, any any proteome that you're interested in. Uh, really, the only requirement on the computational side is that we have a reference proteome, uh, a reference database available. All right. Thank you. Next question. Can the platform identify PTMs in discovery mode? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a complex question. So the, the platform is perfectly capable of measuring PTMs in, even in discovery mode. Um, the, uh, the, through using, for instance, reagents that, that target uh, pan-phosphotyrosine, mm -hmm. the platform is able to look at and say, uh, is there, uh, on, on this particular molecule, um, are we, is there a phosphorylation? Is there not a phosphorylation? Is there a methylation, et cetera? So even in discovery mode, one's able to look at post-translational modifications. Now, one may not be able to fully localize those uh, to know exactly the position of the PTM, but you would be able to, uh, to ask, the, ask the question about um, uh, what percent of molecules are modified, phosphorylated, methylated, et cetera. All right, thank you. Next question. Is there a limitation to the sample types for which this could be used? What are the volume limitations? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, so far, our, our plans for samples are to be fairly general. Uh, so cell lysates of any sort, blood of any sort. Um, the, uh, the, the question of, of just how... Uh, of how much material is used, it is a single molecule platform, so it is extremely sensitive. So we t we would anticipate that uh, that on the order of below one microgram of material, um, one to ten micrograms of material should be sufficient, um, and that corresponds to uh, a, a couple of microliters of blood. Um, and we, of course, are going to work on pushing that down even more. All right. Next question. How does sample multiplexing work? How many can be run at once? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, the 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 I didn't show the architecture of the flow cells, but the flow cells are arranged such that the set of flow cells that are in, inserted into the instrument uh, have twelve lanes, and so there's a natural way to um, multiplex. 12 samples at once. We also are continuing to work on in-lane multiplexing to support even, uh, even more um, multiplexing beyond that. So, um, so there, there are a number of different ways to achieve multiplexing to improve throughput. The consequence, of course, is that there, the greater multiplexing you use, there will be a consequence on dynamic range. Um, we've heard from most people that that the uh, I, sh I should have mentioned up front that the projected dynamic range of uh, ten to the ten um, uh, molecules measured is about nine and a half orders of magnitude in cells and about eleven and a half in blood, um, and so most people are willing to uh, to um, or excited to choose uh, a greater extent of multiplexing for the nominal change in um, 
in uh, in in dynamic range. All right. Next question. Does it matter how a sample has been treated up front? Are denatured samples okay, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So denatured samples are are, are totally great. Um, the one place where uh, there's concern about about samples are, for instance, cross samples that are extensively cross-linked. Um, samples that are extensively cross-linked uh, may be hard to separate into single molecules, uh, and so there's a there's a challenge there. Uh, however, um, for other types of, of, of samples that are denatured or are kept denatured, our current sample handling process further denatures the proteins. Uh, so denaturation is totally, totally okay. All right. Next question. How long does it take in general to analyze the data? That's a good question. So data analysis has a couple different phases. Uh, to it. Uh, one of the phases is from an image processing perspective, things like denoising and deskewing and um, downsampling the images to, uh, to a, a more binarized representation of whether there was a detected binding event or not. Um, that happens basically in real time as the instrument is running. Then there's a second step, which is the, the decoding process, which is the matching of what given a pattern of binding what protein is present uh, and that's a scalable process that um, uh, that uh, one can it's a known as a trivially parallel process and so one can throw more cpu at it to um, to make the process uh, faster um, uh, so we're anticipating on the order of hours uh, for a for that step the downstream analysis of course digging into the biology uh, that takes uh, an, uh, a varied amount of time, as, as all biological investigations do. All right. Next question. How do you deal with potentially differing affinities and cross-reactivity of your multi-target probes to their corresponding cognate targets? If this is too technical to discuss here, I understand, and any insight would be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so I don't think it's too technical because it's one of the major strengths of our platform. Um, we do a lot of work characterizing our probes to understand what their affinities are, what their cross-reactivity profiles are. Um, so I, I mentioned in particular some of the efforts in epitope mapping that we do. Um, that's incorporated directly into the algorithm, um, which anticipates that uh, that kind of cross-reactivity. Um, the differing affinities um, manifest as a likelihood of a binding event. Um, again, in a single molecule context, uh, we you are recognizing that there either was a binding event or was not. And so any given probe will have a given probability of binding to a given epitope. Um, and so that comes from the upfront work that we, we do to, to characterize the probes in depth. All right. Thank you, Parag. Do you have any final comments for our audience? They, I'd just like to thank everyone for taking time um, to, to, to chat with us today. If you have further questions, please do reach out. We're really happy to, to, to help, uh, help explain lean the platform, share the platform with you. Uh, really excited about the potential for this platform uh, as a complement to uh, existing proteomics methods um, for digging deeper and really for getting to sensitivity at scale. Well, thank you again, Parag, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Nautilus Biotechnology, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care, everyone, and goodbye.